Good evening, gentlemen. It is currently 8 p.m. on Wednesday, March 18th, and I am posting this for the next set of lesson plans, which will cover the 19th and the 20th. So this lesson plan, today is the day I've been promising, is finally going to tie together a lot of what we've been talking about and connecting to a lot of what your questions have been, which is... Why do the coronavirus do? How is this virus infecting people? And like, I don't like how virus, why? What, why the virus? So there's a lot of details. I mean, because understanding viruses, understanding our response to it gets into the immune system. Um, and there's a lot of details that we can't really get into. But what I'm really going to give is, you know, an introduction because what we've talked about so far like has in terms of how DNA is structured and how it's read and um, we build proteins from that, that gives you what you need to know about how a virus works and how a virus basically uses a cell to build more viruses. Before we get into that though, a couple people have been saying that they're still a little confused about DNA, the differences between DNA replication, DNA transcription, and translation like so replication transcription translation but so what i want you to remember is don't get into all the nitty gritty details about what the amino acids do what the the nucleotides do yet like start out with thinking about like what's the big picture like what is the point of each of these steps and so to start with that dna replication is literally we have one copy of dna with two halves with the, you know, the ladder running down the middle Actually, hold on. We have one copy of DNA here, and we're going to unzip it down the middle and make another copy so that we wind up with two. Two copies of DNA. And DNA replication only happens during mitosis because you need to copy the DNA to have another full copy of the DNA in the cell that you are creating. Transcription and translation are what the cell does every single day when it needs to access the information in DNA and read it to do the stuff that the cell does. In order to illustrate this, um, I have a little quick sketch that I thought of, and it's in two pieces. So first off, part one of the sketch, I'm illustrating what happens in DNA transcription in which the cell needs to access that information and use it. Hmm make something. Let me look at my list of things to make. Awesome. This seems like a really good recipe. Oh, but I don't want to bring this book into the kitchen. It might get all messed up. Mm. I know. I will copy this recipe down and bring that with me. Okay, part two, what happens in DNA translation, actually RNA translation, where we're going to take that little slip that we made from the store of DNA in the nucleus, and we're going to use it to construct something functional within the cell. Okay, I don't really know what that recipe is that I was going for. I just grabbed my roommate's materials and a bunch of stuff on the counter. But you get the idea that we read the instructions that we copied down and pull together a bunch of amino acids, put them together, and then that's something functional that we refer to as the protein. Everything else is just... You know, the fun details about how we break the code and how the code is used to like translate between the different things. So now what I want to do is do a little bit of a discussion about viruses and the immune system. 
But I think the things that will really tie them together are the two Amoeba Sisters videos I have posted. I'll reference those a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to just talk you through a couple main points using um, some PowerPoint slides that I have together that I'll also post. And also a couple really good articles from the New York Times um, with some really good visuals about coronaviruses specifically and COVID-19, the, the version of coronavirus that we're dealing with now, um, how that, like what that looks like in these processes of a, D, a virus invading a cell and taking it over. So what is a virus? Well, at its most basic sense, a virus is simply a piece of genetic material surrounded by a protein coat. And I say genetic material because some viruses have DNA in the middle and some viruses have RNA in the middle. And here's a nice little example of some common types of viruses. Uh, I was just on a, did an online workshop with the Exploratorium today talking about viruses. And there are so many, so many types of viruses on earth. And those are just ones that we um, can estimate based on ones that we know, and it's probably an underestimation. The way that Julie explained it is take like a hundred million and imagine a hundred million for every single star in the sky. Like that is the astronomical number of viruses that exist on earth, which is really incredible and also possibly a little bit scary. But what you need to remember is that most of these viruses don't attack humans. In fact, most of these viruses don't really do much at all. Um, a lot of the viruses, they're just kind of like hanging around doing their thing, maybe attacking one thing or another. A lot of viruses on Earth are actually bacteriophages, and these are viruses that attack bacteria only. They look really scary because they're all like spidery and stuff, but they, if you exposed yourself to them, they they wouldn't do anything. They'd basically just die or not even die because they're not alive. They would just fall apart because they can't attack our cells. Um, there's also a lot of viruses that attack plants. The tobacco mosaic virus is a very common uh, type of plant virus that's very bad for agricultural crops, obviously like tobacco, but other ones as well. Uh, influenza here which is the virus that causes the actual flu, has this really interesting 20-sided shape called isosahedron. And it's basically a D20 shape is literally what it is. And this is the most common shape for viruses. Apparently most of the viruses that we know of have this type of shape. Um, it was, it was the viruses that, that deal with humans rather have this type of shape or made with some modifications, but obviously it's not the only version out there. And HIV, which is normally the virus we talk about the most in this course, because it's interesting in that it is a virus that attacks the immune system, um, has this interesting shape that's kind of similar, uh, looking at least, to the, uh, the, the coronavirus shape, but with some important differences. Um, but we're today going to focus mostly on talking about coronaviruses, because obviously that's the one that we care about. So what's key to remember about viruses is that they are not living cells. Some of them do have a lipid membrane around the outside. Coronaviruses do. This is one of the things that's interesting about them and one of the things that I didn't know that viruses could have. So I learned something as part of this process. But even with that, the important thing to remember is they are not a cell. They are not alive. They do not have organelles. They do not have ribosomes. They do not have a cytoplasm. They can't do anything a cell can do. So the only way to get more viruses is to hijack a living cell that has all that machinery that you need to, to build proteins and put together copies of DNA and all of that. So in a nutshell, basically what viruses do is they'll inject their genetic material into the cell where it'll be read by the normal cell transcription and translation processes to build more viruses. So you can imagine like that is if I was going to my recipe book and copying down a recipe to make what I was going to make. But then my roommates came and shoved a dis different recipe into my hand and we've been like, oh, okay, well, then I guess I'm going to make this. And I might have wound up with some crazy monstrosity recipe that's even worse than whatever I was trying to make. So that's basically all viruses do is they'll give you that their own genetic material and the cell will read that instead. Here's uh, a little image from Wikipedia that illustrates this process. So we have the normal, this is a, a eukaryotic cell. Um, we got the nucleus here and we can assume that there's organelles in here like Golgi apparatus, ribosomes, blah, 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 blah. 
In this case, the influenza virus gets itself into the cell through whatever means, and in this case, specifically endocytosis to do that glumping in. From there, it'll dissolve and release its genetic material, which eventually, if it makes its way into the nucleus, will start to be read and copied and read and copied. And then the cell will just start making more proteins that build up that outside protein coat of the virus and also copying more copies of that genetic material within it. And then that will eventually construct itself and package itself and then leave the cell to go out and infect more cells. Um, interestingly, so that that was the like the, the the brief overview, but it can get a little bit more complicated. So, uh, with DNA viruses, they inject DNA into a cell, and then RNA viruses inject RNA into a cell. Coronavirus is a type of RNA virus. Um, but what's interesting is that some types of viruses can inject DNA that doesn't immediately make new viruses. It can actually sort of insert itself into the cell's DNA code. So that means that when the cell divides itself through normal mitosis and stuff, it doesn't kill the cell, the cell goes on living, but when it starts dividing through normal mitosis, it's also copying that viral DNA. Um, and then that DNA is frequently stuck in its DNA, in the cell's DNA code for the rest of the cell's life. One example of this is herpes viruses. So some of you may know that once you get herpes, you're stuck with it. Um, cold sores are one example of a type of herpes virus. Um, the viruses that cause warts are very closely related to herpes viruses. And yeah, once you, I mean, you don't always have a cold sore, but if you have one, that means that you have that viral DNA in that part of your body and you probably will forever. It doesn't kill you. It's just kind of, kind of a pain in the butt. Now, luckily, uh, COVID-19 does not do this or uh, it is unlikely that it does this, since other coronaviruses don't insert themselves into DNA strands uh, so far as we know. Now, there's always, you know, the possible option of a crazy mutation somewhere down the line, but it's probably unlikely. So some types of viruses do this, but most types of viruses, including uh, influenza, um, rhinoviruses, which normally cause the flu uh, cause colds, um, they just are just like a, a one to one like make more viruses, make more viruses, and they don't settle in for the long haul. Looking a little bit more specifically at coronaviruses, if you recall from the introductory video, a coronavirus is called that not because it comes from beer, but because they have this interesting spiky crown-looking shape. Um, there's a bunch of actually quite beautiful um, renderings and artwork of it. But images like this are actual microscope images, specifically electron microscope images of what this virus looks like that shows all those spiky proteins on the outside. But now what's interesting about coronaviruses is that in between those proteins, as well as some other structural proteins, there is, uh, rather, there are lipid molecules to form a basically a phospholipid bilayer that's not a true cell membrane because there's no pores or like anything actively exchanging information with the environment, but it is a lipid membrane. And this is important because right now, understanding how this lipid membrane works is our current best uh, weapon against the virus. And by us, I literally mean you and me. You and me are battling this disease right now because of how it is structured. So one of the resources I've linked for you is this New York Times article that's actually kind of like an uh, interactive um, infographic about how coronavirus hijacks your cells. To access it on your own, you'll need to log in to the school's New York Times website or New York Times, New York Times website account. It's free. Um, the information is on the agenda and you can just be logged in all the time to access New York Times articles whenever you want for free. So here we see a cartoon rendering showing those spiky proteins and this lipid membrane within it. Like a 3D view here shows this. So th these are the lipid molecules, these are the proteins, and then this is the genetic material encased inside the virus. So as we saw in that intro video that I showed you, this virus attaches to the surface of cell membranes by sticking to certain proteins that are already embedded in that cell membrane. And the only way it's able to fit is if this viral protein happens to have mutated to be a shape that fits. 
So as we saw in that intro video, some viruses have proteins that allow them to fit into cell or stick to cells like bird cells or bat cells that are completely different species. And so they're able to stick pretty well. And they would, ha but they on their own wouldn't be able to infect human cells. The only way that this happened, and we know that it happened because we're dealing with it right now, is somewhere down the line there were mutations that changed the genetic material of the virus that changed the structure of these proteins in just such a way that happened to attach themselves to the proteins in human cells. And that's why last time I was so very specific about how the genetic code dictates the shape of the protein and the changes to the genetic code change the shape of the protein, which this is a perfect example about how that, how that results, um, or rather what can result from it. So this is not the virus thinking to itself, hmm, I want to attack humans now. How am I going to change it and like fix it so that I do? This is a random mutation that just happened to work in such a way that it could stick to human cells. Now, the thing to remember is that the reason that this happened is because humans were coming into contact with the sorts of animals that were carrying these viruses. Specifically, we probably think a bat or a pagdolin. Both of these animals are very cute, and both of these animals are unfortunately traded both legally and illegally in open markets in parts of East Asia. Normally in the wild, they would just be doing their own thing and rarely coming into contact with humans or each other. But if you increase contact between these species, you increase the, the chances that the one pagdolin that happened to have a mutated version of this virus that could also attack humans happened to be exposed to a human so that the human picked up the virus and then it went. And from there is where it went. Anyway, so the virus gets into the cell and from there it can dissolve and release its genetic material. Well, once it's in here, the cell doesn't know that it's genetic material from a viral or from a virus. It's the exact same genetic nucleotides that we normally use. It's the same uh, ACs uh, damn it, A, G, C's, and U's, because it's RNA, A, C, G, and U, and the ribosomes read it and just start building more proteins because they're like, oh, we're doing the thing. That's fine. Well, those proteins that they're building are the viral proteins that build up the structure of the virus. So once it gets into there and starts going through the endoplasmic reticulum, they're making these viral proteins instead of the things they're supposed to be making. The nucleus might start copying the RNA and to make more copies of that viral RNA. The Golgi apparatus is going to collect all these and package them together as it normally does. It's the shipping and receiving department. And then what it's going to be shipping out is death. Or hopefully not death, but definitely more copies of the virus. So then from there, the way that the virus spreads to other uh, other individuals is if those viral particles are, sometimes they are in droplets uh, that we spit when we sneeze or cough. That's the most common way. Um, there's some concern that this specific version of the virus may actually just kind of like float out on air, not even in droplets. So then it may like spread for a little bit on the air before falling down. We're still trying to figure that out. And we're also trying to figure out how long it lives on certain surfaces, not lives, how long it can be intact on certain surfaces like counters, doorknobs, uh, cardboard, all of that before it just falls apart on its own. Because they do fall apart on their own eventually. Now what I want to talk about is a little bit about the immune system. Um, but the way, my favorite way to explain it is with my one of my favorite mobile games of all time. Maybe you're aware of it. It's Plants vs. Zombies. So if you're not familiar with it, the goal of this game is there's a dude who is holed up in this house, much like we are holed up today, and he's trying to defend his house from zombies, or rather you are trying to defend his house from zombies by planting different types of plants. And they're all, you know, cute. Um, but what's interesting is that each of these plants have different abilities to fight zombies. Like there's some that like have ranged attacks. There's some that like don't move around, like these spuds that explode. 
There's some walnut, it's my favorite because it just acts as a wall so that the zombies have to eat their way through before they climb over. Um, there's always there's a last line of defense with these lawnmowers that'll zoom all the way out and try to mow down all the zombies. Um, but the point of the matter is, in this game, one of the best strategies to have is not just one row of plants, but many row of plants, and specifically many types of plants. Because you'll see some zombies have specific abilities, like some of them are able to jump, and some of them also have their own ranged attacks. So you want different types of things around to try to attack these different types of zombies that might come in. The idea is kind of a good model for what happens in the immune system, because basically you don't want just one line of defense, you want multiple lines of, de of defense. And the immune system basically has three lines of defenses. The first ones are the simplest ones that are just kind of static and there all the time. Things like um, your, our skin helps keep us from getting infected. Uh, things like mucus that like tries to rinse things out. Um, our second line of defense that just activates for pretty much anything are thing, is things like inflammation. Um, uh, fever is actually a second line of defense. Like that's something that we're definitely seeing happen with coronavirus. Fever uh, gets us really hot because that tr both speeds up the efficiency of our own immune system and also helps break down viral proteins. So a little bit of fever is okay. The danger is just when it gets too hot, um, if your fever is consistent, rises to 103 Fahrenheit or above, that is when you want to seek medical attention for sure. Anyway, so these are like the first two lines of defense that they're able to get past most things, but or keep most things from getting past. Um, at the, but the interesting one that sometimes gets triggered sometime at the same time as the second line of defense is the adaptive immune system. And that's the thing, the part of the immune system that's able to specifically target specific uh, specific um, enemies and specific uh, pathogens. As an example of what this looks like with antibodies attacking a virus or helping our body attack a virus, going back to the New York Times article here, what we see is that here's a, um, a coronavirus, here's another type of virus. Well, these like Y-shaped proteins here are the antibodies. And the, oh, this is flu. That's what it is. Anyway, so these are special proteins that stick to the proteins on the outside of the virus, but they are basically act as a big shape that draws the attention of things like the, the, the T cells that will come and be able to attack it more effectively. Um, so here we don't have uh, of an antibody or rather our, our bodies, if we're fighting off coronavirus, are trying to generate antibodies that will specifically target coronavirus. Notice that the shape is important. Um, the, the flu antibody needs this sort of triangular, a little bit suggestive shape right there. That shape will not work on the antibodies, or sorry, on the proteins on the outside of the coronavirus because it's a completely different shape. So protein shape matters and the antibodies have to be specifically adapted to fitting those shapes on the outside of the virus. But now where things get interesting is there are ways to develop vaccines that basically train our body to develop antibodies by giving it the shapes that it needs to match to. So our body can develop antibodies to match that vaccine protein shape so that later when we see, oh, well, this isn't a whole, you know, this isn't a whole virus, it's just a bunch of protein, it doesn't matter because that antibody that we've generated fits that same shape. So we can take that antibody and stick it on this cell just as easily as this antibody can stick on this cell. So that is what a lot of people are doing when they're trying to uh, generate vaccines to help train our own bodies to, to deal with it. Now, there are some types of vaccine treatments. Uh, some people ask, well, can't you just inject the antibodies in directly? Yeah, you can do that. Um, but then once those antibodies wear down or like, you know, like get, get flushed out of your system, your body may not have generated the memory T cells to remember how to fight it again in the future. You just use the antibodies to help you deal with the disease at that time. Um, but that is a good like temporary treatment. Um, and some people are, are working on, on doing that as well to help treat the virus. Last thing I want to talk about, as I mentioned, is that we right now, besides, you know, our immune systems, 
hopefully learning to deal with the virus and besides generating vaccines to help our immune systems, we are able to fight coronavirus in our homes using tools that we have quite cheaply available. So as I mentioned, the coronavirus has these cool proteins sticking out, but also this lipid membrane around it and lipids are fats. And what do we do when we have a bunch of fats like on our hands, say we spill like some grease on our hands? Well, we go to our buddy here called soap. And if you remember when we did the um, bubble membrane lab, soap works very similar to uh, the, the, the lipids of the phospholipid bilayer because they've got this head region that's hydrophilic and wants to be attracted towards water and this tail region that's hydrophobic and wants to be repelled from water. Well, what happens is these soap molecules come in and disrupt the normal lipid molecules that surround the outside of the virus because they're just like, hey, I'm just going to squeeze in here and oh, this is pretty good, you guys. Oh, that's great. But they're not shaped exactly the same, so they end up messing up the whole pattern. Then once they do that, they form these little like lipid bubbles called micelles that surround each of these chunks of the virus. So chunks of the, the genetic material, chunks of the protein, all that. They've basically broken it down and packaged it up into uh, these little mini bubbles. Well, since these heads of the micelles are attracted to water, when we come and stick this soap underwater, they're like, ooh, great, and they easily wash away and wash off everything that before had been stuck on this oily surface uh, of our hands. So this is something that hopefully all of us are doing all the time to literally dissolve the virus on contact. So this is why I've been so emphatic about washing your hands because any soap, any soap at all will do exactly this. Even cheap soap, even fancy decorated soap that sits around in the bathroom and your mom's like, don't use it because it's supposed to be for guests. And you're like, what guests? Guests aren't using it. Guests are using the normal soap, just like the rest of us. Well, in this day, in this time, in this, this era, you can use the fancy soaps to help fight coronavirus. As I mentioned, this is a huge area of like how viruses work, how the immune system works. And I've tried to, done my, tried to do my best in touching base on a couple different things, but watch those Amoeba Sisters videos. They explain it in much more edited detail than I do. And hopefully hearing it in different ways and seeing different pictures will help give you a better sense of it. I've also linked to those two New York Times pieces that you can scroll through on your own and read through on your own, and that's pretty great. For the practice today, what I would like you to do for my genetics day five check-in, rather than simply being like, how are you doing? Like, give me some feedback. I would like you to write your own answers for the three learning objective topics um, for today, which are, what is a virus? How do they, viruses, hijack living cells to make more of themselves? And how does the immune system protect against pathogens? And it doesn't need to be an excruciating detail, but I want at least a couple sentences for each of these bullet points, because I've given you a wealth of resources to reflect on in your own time um, and explore and try to like come up with a two or three sentence statement for each of these bullet points that summarizes it. Um, then once you submit that, you can hopefully see other students' responses. And if you give help me give feedback to other students, then you can earn some points of extra credit. But this on its own will be uh, participation credit. However, this specific assignment is going to build toward something I'm going to give you next week. Uh, I've been meeting with teachers at the school about like how this is going. It looks looking like it's going to go longer. Is it the best system for everybody? Um, some people, and by people I mean students, have been saying I've, that they have teachers that are giving them stuff every day. They shouldn't be doing that. That's too much stuff. Um, so we're going to try to switch gears, and I'm definitely switching gears because this is partially my idea, to a slightly different format that I'll explain more next week because I'm going to put together a bunch of material on Monday to, um, to help structure it out. But just know that, like, this hasn't been just like, oh, we're going to do the things and it's done. No, like I'm specifically working towards like a pro like a project sort of thing that I'm, I'm going to give give to you about not only how DNA works in the cell, but how viruses work. So use this um, assignment now to help kind of practice thinking about it, get some feedback from me, um, because it'll directly help you into what we're looking at next week. So this is probably already a very long video, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, 
if you have other questions or concerns for me, I mean, you can post them in the, the check-in discussion or email them to me. I've been hearing just a couple, you know, it's, it's good to hear that you guys are engaging. Thank you very much. Um, a couple people I've seen, you've been logging into Schoology and logging into the course materials, but you haven't been submitting them. You still have time to do that, but don't wait too long and have like all these assignments back up on you. Cause again, they're going to really help, uh, build knowledge towards what I want you to do next week. Thank you for watching. Wash your hands. Only you can stop coronavirus. <laughs>